Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, we have a really wonderful panel lined up for this topic of urban homesteading and urban farming. Um, I'm trying to get people in. I think there's more of us. Um, let me uh, make a, a few introductions here. Um, Andy You're Lipkiss. attending the Urban Homestead panel. I'm sorry, I have to ask what, that's incredibly loud. Is that coming through a speaker? I think so. Oh, she's outside. Oh, is that what that, she's got the microphone. Okay. <laughs> it's not going to the bathroom, I Susan. hope. It is, thank you. Okay. Uh, Andy Lipkiss, he's the founder and president of Tree People. It's a really wonderful organization and all they've done. And if I'm not mistaken, it was founded in 1973. Is that correct? Um, Andy Lipkiss is a local foodie. He's a uh, trained chef. He trained in the greater Mekong River watershed of Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, and Laos. He rides his bike at least to two farmer's markets each week, which is fantastic. Um, he uh, founded the local nonprofit group, Tree People. He was 15. It's fantastic. It really is fantastic that you've spent your life doing this. He uh, developed um, the organization's fruit tree program. Um, since 1983, they have distributed over 150,000 fruit trees uh, to families in the communities throughout Southern California. Tree People has developed programs to support volunteers and partner um, organization help reforest the food deserts in our region, schools, and neighborhoods. Andy recently starred in Dirt, uh, the movie, and served as a judge on Cupcake Wars. He enjoys raising oranges, passion fruit, bananas, kumquats, grapes at his home in Venice. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your organization and um, how you contribute to urban farming and urban homesteading and the community at large. Um, and, then, and then also, to, if you could explain that you have to cut out. I will do that. <laughs> Thank you. I was thinking that we were going to go down the line with intros, so I'm going to turn on my timer. Oh, you know what? Just, uh, let, me, let me do that. Okay, let me, let me do that. Let me go on with the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the introduction. Um, uh, next, Andy, is Eric Knudsen. Eric Knudsen and his wife, Kelly, um, they're the authors of the book, The Urban Homestead, and their newest book is called Making It, Radical Home Ec for a Post-Consumer World. Uh, they founded the blog Root Simple. Uh, it was formerly known as Homegrown Evolution. Uh, they did that in 2006. Um, they live in Los Angeles in the Silver Lake region in a small bungalow on about one twelfth of an acre lot where most of the land is devoted to growing edible or otherwise useful plants and trees. Their obsession includes bees, bikes, beer, chickens, dogs, healthy cities, healing herbs, simple food, and good food in general. Um, and then next to Eric, we have uh, Ricky Smith. Um, Unspring is the latest project of the social entrepreneur. Um, and as part of his larger organization, Urban Green. Uh, described by Smith as social entrepreneurship, it revolved around regenerative sustainability. Um, Urban Green operates a half-acre farm that grows produce for the headquarter production facility, as well as raises chickens to provide eggs for the bakery. Um, at the Urban Green's Pasadena headquarters, the treats, sandwiches, and salads are prepared and delivered to farmers markets, retail partners, and catered events. Waste from the headquarters kitchen and bakery make their way into high quality compost that feeds the garden on spring and the farm in Rancho Cucamonga. Urban Green Group Foundation continues to educate the community on skills that encourage sustainable living and the development of local micro, micro uh, enterprises. And at the end of the table is Miguel Luna. Uh, Miguel Luna is the founder of Urban Semillas, a community-based organization working on water and urban farming issues uh, in uh, LA County. He serves on the city of LA's Food Policy Council and is a master gardener. Um, so welcome to all of you. And let's, um, let's have uh, Andy uh, Lipkis uh, tell us more about himself and his organization and what he's working on. Well, thanks, Craig, and it's great to be here with, I guess I don't have to, 
lean up to the mic. It's great to be here with all of you, and thank you, audience, for waking up early on a Sunday and crawling out without brunch to be here with us. Um, and I also um, want to apologize for having to leave. The, this was originally going to be an earlier panel, and I got scheduled at another conference across town, and so I have to speak and depart, and I'm not going to get to participate in the back uh, and forth in the questions. Uh, and I intended to go further towards the end because um, not being specifically an urban homesteader, uh, what Tree People's about is support and the infrastructure for people to do this stuff. So I'm going to offer you skills and some stories and, and resources that you'll plug in after you get the hunger for all the things you can do. Um, my timer's not helping me right now. So we were asked to say a few words about our organization. Tree People, um, I, I founded it, well, I started the work 41 years ago uh, growing up here in LA. Um, in a sense, is a response to the insanity that I saw that I, I guess I was an early responder uh, because I think we're all waking up to it now. Um, I began planting trees in the forests in San Bernardino National Forest because I learned as a kid that they were dying from smog because of what we were doing here. Um, and started working with other kids to try to save the forest, planting smog-resistant trees. But the whole work shifted in priority to here in town because all we were doing up there was putting band-aids on a situation that was kind of irreversible. Hundreds of kids planting trees, then thousands of us, still wasn't enough to reverse the impacts of millions of people mindlessly damaging the, damaging the environment. And as we did more and more work in the city, our work really evolved around our mission, which is to inspire, engage, and support the people of Southern California in taking personal responsibility for the environment and making this a healthy, safe, fun, and sustainable urban environment uh, and to share our process, not just our good news story, but our process, including our successes and our failures, share that with other, other areas and other cities. We find that our failures are really compost for success. Um, the way we're going to not just recycle an old back to the, our roots movement and actually take ourselves to healing this environment and others and move us to a level of sustainability is to accelerate the work and get more and more people involved. So the fact that you're here, we're here, clearly you're committed, we're, we're pioneers and um, hopefully the work we're doing today is going to uh, help equip you to take first steps or take the deep work that you're already doing deeper. Uh, <clears throat> we're known as tree planters, tree people. We used to plant trees for people even when we moved into town. Uh, it was very heroic. People said, we want trees, we need them. We would go plant them. We would have, always have a, a street party and f food fest after doing the planting. It was a great celebration, but we found when we were just doing it to people, uh, that they didn't stick around and water the trees for years afterwards so they didn't live uh, like we would like them to do. And our work shifted during a recession not as bad as this one when we couldn't afford to just go plant trees. But people still wanted them. We said, well, we can teach you what to do. We can teach you how to get the permits and we can support you with tools, with hundreds of volunteers, but you're going to have to lead it. You're going to have to raise a little money and we'll get stuff to match it. Well, that turned out to be the magic. When people really made it theirs. And we could support them taking a dream or an idea and making it real. We, we formalized it into a training that we've been doing now since 1984. Um, we call it the Citizen Forester Training. And we train people. We basically have created a factory for your dreams. Anything you want to make happen in your neighborhood, whether it's you want to change the look of the feel of your street, you plant a schoolyard to protect your kids from too much sun, um, or create a little wetland in a park or whatever. We have the mechanism to train you how to 
make that real. Take your, your dream from a dream idea and bring it across the bridge to reality. Give you skills in how to get your permits, how to get the political support, how to get PR and attention. Um, the key thing to all the stuff that we do here in LA is <clears throat> when we're homesteading or farmsteading or, or pioneering the way we are, we're up against bureaucracies and systems that aren't used to us participating and don't know how to meet us and so often undo all of our good work. They take the trees out that you've planted in schools. Um, it's like white blood cells from the system that we're trying to fix that attack us. So we've built an infrastructure of support from training, as I said, to um, we train volunteers to support people both in planting and in care of their trees. So if you have an idea and it's going to take 150 volunteers to make it happen on your street, if you've gone through our training but you can only get 20 people from your community, we will be there with the insurance, the trucks, the other 120 people, trained experts and the tools to make sure you succeed. It's your project. We like to say it's one that we've cross-pollinated and supported you with. And we like to take you all the way th through your, your care of the thing. Um, sorry, I keep checking the technology. Okay, I've got a few minutes left. Um, the question was, oh, we moved from simply planting trees over time to learn that the work in order to truly, I informally and now more and more formally say that this work is about healing our communities and rebuilding the fabric of community. Food is a very big piece of it. Trees have become for us acupuncture needles. Using the right tree in the right place with the intention of it solving a problem, healing a problem, is very, very potent. And just like with food, with farming, we have to build literacy on these tools. A tree can feed people, a tree can save energy, it can shade people, but the wrong tree in the wrong place can also use too much water. It can have pollen that people are allergic to. It can destroy infrastructure. So it's a powerful tool. It has to be used right. As we have focused more and more in meeting the needs of underserved communities, fruit trees have played a bigger and bigger role. And uh, our involvement in food trees goes pretty deep. So back in 1983, we learned that a million fruit trees were burnt the prior year from the growers in Northern California. So they grow beautiful peaches, plums, apricots, all kinds of fruit trees. And if people don't buy them, they burn them because they don't want to undermine their market. We were able to convince them to start giving us the trees. In the first year, we organized a convoy of trucks, got 40,000 trees rented a refrigerated warehouse in Vernon, and then worked with churches, food banks, organizations all over Southern California and distributed them. And that's what began our, our program. Um, and over time, um, we stopped taking free trees because they weren't the right ones for our climate. So right, a tree needs to go in the climate zone that it's meant to if it's going to produce fruit. And we didn't want to make the promise that plant this tree and it's going to feed you apples and have it not produce. So for most of the time, probably since 1986, we tree people that raises the money, buys the trees, and then works uh, increasingly in more and more focused ways with organizations, either to create a community fruit orchard uh, or distribute through a church, through a food bank. Um, through schools. So there are now many school gardens all over town with fruit trees where kids are harvesting uh, fruit. Uh, an interesting extrapolation story is that uh, when the Ethiopian famine hit in um, 1986, uh, more fruit trees came online that were going to be burnt and we started working even then, we learned from one of our staff who worked for the Peace Corps that they would, there were areas in Africa where people would eat our, the fruit, and we saw it being uh, important to show that it was possible to successfully have people plant trees and not cut them down to burn them as firewood. The reason why is these fruit trees produce fruit in the, the first year. We were surprised. You're not meant to. The Bible and 
Sunset Magazine, uh, Sunset Garden Book, other horticultural Bibles all recommend if a tree produces fruit the first few years, take, take it off so you develop a better root system. But in communities where there isn't a lot of hope and there's a lot of false promises, we want to allow people to, to know that their work was going to produce something that was going to feed their family pretty quickly. So we encourage people to keep a couple pieces of fruit on the tree and um, to stay engaged with their tree and say it wasn't a false promise. The same thing worked really well as we worked in villages in Kenya, Tanzania, the Cameroon, and, and in Ethiopia. Those are just a um, side story. I want to close with um, a quick story about uh, how we work now and as an example of the resources that we have. So that's my 11 minutes. Stop. And I've got two more. Essentially. Yeah, go ahead. Um, last year we formed, so Tree People works in partnership with organizations, whether it's a church, whether it's a school, whether it's you as an individual, whether it's a, a neighborhood organization. <clears throat> what we, uh, we like to form partnerships, and one we just did that's been really successful is with the Social Justice Learning Network. Um, D'Artanian Scorza began working with us, and um, he's been working in the Inglewood, South LA area, and got a whole green team of people he was working with to be trained in our citizen forester training. Together, we planned a huge set of events in Inglewood around Morningside High School with food workshops, food prep workshops, nutrition workshops, and then we brought in hundreds of fruit trees. But one of his volunteers, Nicole Carter, uh, moved to LA, moved to Inglewood, and um, she, they were a one-family car. She, she got pregnant, her husband had the car, and she realized that she lived in a food desert. She realized that everything within walking distance of her home, there was no nutrition, nothing that was going to help her raise a healthy baby. And, so, and she didn't have space to grow a garden at home, so she found a space, a piece of vacant land right across from Morningside High. It was abandoned land, just a little triangle, completely paved, covered with weeds. She found out through the skills that we gave her how, who owned it, turned out to be owned by the city of Inglewood. She went and got permission to farm it. She ripped up the, the concrete. Amazingly, in the process of doing that, she found this pipe in the ground that turned out to be an old well. It was capped, and there was no water on the site. And <clears throat> she couldn't afford to raise the money for, for the water department to make the connection so she could water the garden. But she wound up raising the money and getting a grant to, to reactivate the well with a solar panel, put a tank on, and has this amazing garden um, that's growing organic food. She's teaching, uh, involving some of the kids from Morningside High across the street. It's producing lovely organic vegetables. The day we did the fruit tree distribution, a, a, an amateur football team helped um, plant another 15 fruit trees in the garden. She's thriving and surviving. And uh, now the city noticed that the lot is valuable and wants to take it back, which is what often happens in this. But she's built a whole community of support. I don't think she's going to lose. Um, it, it's a great story, and it's a great example of what's possible. And just in conclusion, we were asked to talk about what are three things that you could do. Um, first of all, this might not be the right work for you, but if it's of interest, um, what we need to be doing as a movement is rebuilding our own home's strength, what you're doing in your lifestyle and our neighborhood, to start rebuilding really the basis of the economy. That is what this is about, <clears throat> creating value in gardens, in the neighborhood, at home, going local, and recycling your dollars and your energy here. That's how nature always does it. That's how communities have actually built strength <clears throat> <clears throat> to recover from economic crises. We have to follow our dollars because when you go certain places and spend your money in chain stores, often your money leaves the country that night. Think about going to farmer's markets or creating them. So rebuilding that strength. If you're not up for leading, volunteer. Find out who's doing stuff that could use your energy. There's lots 
of groups. You're here, there's probably a lot of displays of organizations that are doing stuff. Whatever you do can help and make the difference between an idea succeeding and failing. Taking the time, number three, is if this is of interest. You can take the time to get trained by an organization like Tree People. You'll hear about Master Gardeners. There's so many skills and so much support that if you take the time to learn, and of course now you guys have been producing stuff, books, and there's courses online for free, um, that you can get the skill to ensure that you succeed. Connect with a network to ensure that you have the support so you don't feel beaten down by the system. You can become a citizen forester. You can join our new fruit tree crew, which is actually going to be producing support for urban orchards that have been failing. So we're building volunteer ranks so you know how and we'll be able to deploy you in caring for orchards that have already been created. You can become a planting supervisor to help other people plant. And uh, we have a new program called Citizen Arborist that gives you the skill and uh, support and authority to take care of city trees that are now not being cared for because the city budget crisis. So thank you. Uh, uh, treepeople.org, uh, you can see all kinds of opportunities to volunteer. And if you don't feel like volunteering, we can always use your support as a member. That's how we survive. Thanks. Thank you. It's an incredible legacy to think of all the people that have eaten from the trees that your organization has given away and donated. So it's an incredible, and they will for many, many years. So thank you for coming thank today you. and just sorry drive I have safe. to bail on you. He's yeah, <laughs> just getting started. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming. Drive safe thank to your you. next talk. Um, Why don't we, um, shall we hear from uh, Ricky Smith next? Um, quickly tell us a, a bit more about your organization and what you do with your organization and how an individual can be inspired by it, mm -hmm. uh, learn from what you do, mm -hmm. and apply it to uh, their daily living and to, to become as you, in your term, which I really love, is regenerative. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a wonderful word that describes um, what you're working towards and what you are working on. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to express my gratitude uh, to the Good Food Festival, it's, uh, uh, the organizers, uh, Laura Avery, uh, Jen Slama, uh, the sponsors, and most importantly, um, all of you who have been participating um, Urban Green is a, I describe it as a social entrepreneurship, and we're going to be talking this morning, and one of the things that I think is happening right now that um, concerns me is we're getting attached to too many uh, labels, and, but because all of this is new. Um, Urban Green is, uh, can be described as a social entrepreneurship. Uh, what we do and our purpose, and that's the other thing I want to say, we, we don't really have a mission statement. Uh, but my organization does have a purpose, and the purpose is simple. Uh, the purpose is to build a linked system ecosystem in the Southern California area that is constantly producing food for the benefit of humans. Um, we want to restore, develop, and promote open and green space in the Southern California area, and the way that we go about this is by uh, approaching individuals, uh, homeowner stakeholders, uh, city governments, state, and e even federal governments about taking over vacant lots, um, even your, your front yards. Uh, we've approached people about buildings to do vertical growing. Uh, we've approached developers about putting uh, green roofs and uh, farms on, on, uh, on buildings in downtown Los Angeles. And we go in and we do soil remediation. Uh, we start from seed and we plant uh, urban farms. Uh, these can be uh, in the ground or as in the case of my uh, uh, urban farm in downtown because it's on state property that uh, we have helped make historical. Uh, we were not able to go into the ground so it's perfect to do raised agriculture bins or container growing. We then harvest this food uh, or this produce. We bring it back to our central kitchens 
and we create value added products that we distribute through farmers markets. Uh, we're going to begin a relationship with Whole Foods where uh, this produce that we're growing in downtown Los Angeles, in Pasadena, and other locations in Southern California will be on the shelves in the form of value added products. Uh, we use the produce that we grow for our catering uh, aspect, which we do for the University of Southern California and other uh, colleges and organizations like the American Institute of Architects. And then we use the waste from our headquarters to go back out into the fields to regenerate, to compost, to fertilize uh, the land that, that we are using, or we create value-added products out of it. Um, and then uh, what we do at these locations is we provide instruction, uh, education about the healthy eating uh, and just general health, uh, such things as we provide uh, free yoga classes uh, at the state park. Um, and just general things that to, to improve the lives of humans. Um, one of the basic principles of Urban Green is that uh, I use permaculture principles in our business practices. Um, and to mm, abbreviate it, we use air, earth care, fair share, and people care in our business practice to help fund the nonprofit aspects that we're doing, which is under the umbrella of the Urban Green Group Foundation. And this has been self-funded. I started this in earnest in 1985 when I was a corporate member of a Fortune 500 company. I was a brand manager uh, at a Fortune 500 company, and I presented this concept because they had spent a great deal of money educating me. They paid for my last two years of college, and I went into this company and I said, well, uh, I have this idea, it's called Urban Green, where we take our cities, we repurpose them, we grow in the vacant lots, we grow in the vacant buildings, and they were, whoa, 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 <laughs> this company has been around for 150 years, uh, you should be happy that you're here, uh, it's gonna be long, <laughs> long after you leave, uh, just repeat what's been done, and repeat what's been done. And I knew I wasn't gonna stay there long, and I knew I couldn't stay in that general corporate environment very long because I had come from what people called uh, country poor. I grew up in Wartrace, Tennessee, and if you really want to know where it began, it began in 1888 when my grandfather was born. His name is Gardner Smith, and he was always a free man. The only information I could find was that he was born in New York, he moved to Tennessee, um, he had money somehow. I don't know, you know how he was able to attain it during those period, but he bought uh, five acres of land which my entire family lived on in Wartrace, Tennessee. We had a river that ran through it, the Duck River, so I grew up fishing with my grandmother. Uh, we had our own, our own livestock like pigs and cows. My aunt had a, a dairy farm on the back end of the property. My grandmother lived down from me. She had pigs, which she would slaughter. I could not get involved in that. <laughs> my dad, my uncle that lived on the, the back property near my aunt was a mason, so he did all the building. Uh, my father uh, went to the Air Force and worked in the mortar pool and became an Air Force mechanic. So he did all the physical work and me and my sisters and siblings grew okra, uh, sweet wow. peas, and corn and everything on our property. Ricky, with um, it, it, fantastic. I, it, with the experience that you gained with your family mm -hmm. on that five acres, mm -hmm. and the the diversity that was employed there, and then the experience that you gained since '85 when mm -hmm. you founded your current organization, what um, what can a person who lives in the middle of Los Angeles mm -hmm. do? What advice would you give them? Where does somebody start? Okay. Where, what, what seed do they plant to um, move their life into a direction of, that's regenerative, okay. that's resilient, mm -hmm. as Eric would say, that's closer to sustainable? Okay. I, I've lived it. Um, I had these big jobs. Well, tell and, us, give us the secret. <laughs> and uh, there, there is, that's, that's the thing. We are not experts. We are sitting here on this panel, and, but no one really knows. That's what I want to say. You have all the knowledge within you to, uh, to uh, achieve what little I have accomplished. I started Urban Green in an alley, off an alley in Venice, right over here, 406 Grand near the Venice Library, because I had fallen down. I left the corporate sector. I left all of that because it did not, 
resonate with my being. So I wanted something that was integrated with my own values and my own principles. And in doing that and going kind of off the grid and not taking the jobs and, and using my education that way, I came to a point where I was living off an of alley in Venice and I had $36. So Urban Green was created out of necessity. It was created out of poverty. It was created out of a void. And basically what I did, I started where I was. Um, and it was an internal shift. And so that's where I say you begin. You begin by going inside yourself rather than outside yourself to an expert or information and begin with your own values and your own principles. And what that was for me personally is I wanted to be part of a solution. I had been educated very well and had very good uh, education and experience and very good experiences like I knew Bib Swain who developed biofuels. He was my neighbor and his son was my best friend back in, in the 70s. So I was privy to a lot of information. So when I started Urban Green out of poverty with $36, I began where I was. I didn't have money. So I began being broke. I began a Sunday dinner that's part of the Southern tradition where I invited my friends to come over and enjoy the food that I would make because I didn't, couldn't afford to go out to movies or events with them. So it began as a Sunday dinner and I created this organic pecan tart that uh, 50 people came, turned into 150 on my patio in Venice. <laughs> and you start where you are. The, uh, people are asking, what is this? This is the first tin that uh, a customer returned. We started a recycling program when we began. I made these mini organic tarts that I would sell in this little tin that at the time was 42 cents. We don't do it anymore because the advent of China and their development, these tins are now a dollar twenty, and they're more than, than the pies. But start where you are. And customers would buy the tins, and I would give them discounts for returning and putting these organic tarts. So make it internal, make it personal with you, and begin where you are. People often come by and they see urban green, and there's so much greenwash, and they go, what makes you green? And I said, it's not any one thing because everyone wants to be in the territory so bad and everyone wants to do right away, I think you have to start at a point of being. What makes us urban green is we're building green systems. Yeah. It's not the fact that, that we compost. It's not the fact that uh, you know, we don't even have biofuel uh, vehicles because I disagree with it because I knew the impact it would have having grown up and listening to Air Force Colonel uh, Bib Swain, they would have an impact of causing uh, um, a famine in, in other parts of the world. But we are building to, uh, looking to build a whole system. We, 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 we take the waste in our system and we create something out of it to improve people's lives. One of the quick other principles I have to say is that so many people doing, what can I do? If you're gonna be part of the Urban Green organization, we start with the principle that the earth does not need us, it really does not need you to save it. The earth was around long before man came aboard. It'll be here long after we leave. What I feel we need to do now is pay more attention to the lessons that the earth is trying to tell us and, and not do so much. Let's listen a little bit more. And, 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 and as I said in the beginning, you have it inside of you. The information is there from observing, and that's another permaculture principle, to observe your environment and learn from it. And so those things are, are, are the things that I feel are most important. Don't move or don't do something just to make yourself feel better. Urban Green is an organization that's constantly doing research. We will never set ourselves up as experts, but we are constantly uh, doing research. We are constantly uh, implementing this information we get to improve the system as we go along. So, um, I mean, that, that's my answer to your question. I think it's, well, it's fantastic. I think the, the uh, clear message I have from you is urban homesteading, urban farming are two terms. Yes. But the, the beginning is internal, whether you live on a half acre, an acre, five acres, a hundred acres, or live in an apartment in a high rise. Yes. It's uh, clearly, it's uh, giving thought to your own actions the way you live to mm -hmm. be part of a bigger movement to, to help the earth heal itself. 
Yes. It's fantastic. And, and also have, have, have a purpose. I mean, uh, we get caught up in terms a lot, and I came from the corporate world, so I knew that when I started my organization, you need to have a mission statement. Well, missions begin and they end. And this is not a mission for me. This is a way of life. It's something that I want to exist long after I'm gone. So I, I would like to you know, repurpose it as we do have a purpose. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Um, thank you. It was uh, very exciting. Very exciting what you're doing. I think very inspiring. And I think a lot of people can, can learn from that simple message that it does start internally. Mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. the... Uh, it doesn't and, and, take much. What did you say, $36? $36. <laughs> and Urban Green has been self-funded because I, I didn't want to, I, I did not want to subjugate what I was doing. Um, I, w I wanted to get things going, and, and Andy was talking about the bureaucracy. So everything's been self-funded up to this point, and I've done as much as I can do. And um, so we are looking for volunteers, and we are looking uh, for, for help from uh, you know, the community, because we're here to serve you. Um, and we have a, a plan that is regenerative. Everything in our system goes back into the system. And there is leakage. But what we're trying to do is uh, reduce that and continue to reduce that so that so everything is used. And the other thing I want to get across is that there is plenty. All the media sources, we say, say we're in trouble. Regardless whether the earth or, or, or the tipping point has happened, going into fear, going into worry is not going to do anything. So I do encourage you to take action, not, not tomorrow, but right now, and, and take it in your heart and take it in internally. And, and, and as Andy said, be conscious of what you're doing because regardless of what the future holds, I, I do and I am optimistic that man has always found a way to adapt. Yeah. in his existence and that we continue to do. But we have to stop setting ourselves up as the center of the universe because we're not. And the earth was not built for our, our, our pleasure and our leisure and for us just to take. Uh, a great deal of uh, what human activities looks to me to be a virus upon the earth. So what I'm saying now, we need an internal change where we can learn from the earth and, and learn to live with it rather than subjugate it, uh, control it, and, and, um, and, and just control it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Miguel, tell us um, about your organization, Urban Simeus. Uh, give us a little overview of that. And, and also, I'm interested what you're doing, what you have learned from that organization, and what your, um, what your message would be for people to to, uh, to make a change in their life, to further a change in their life if they've already started that, tr that journey? Sure. Well, I'm always uh, very pleased uh, to be in this field, and this field is just a, a social field because um, I'm always inspired uh, every time I meet new people. And so your story is very inspiring, and I'm so glad that I'm, I'm, I'm able to be here and hear it and, and be inspired by it. So thank you, Ricky, for sharing that. Um, a lot of our work uh, um, evolves around um, culture, and uh, as it pertains to uh, agriculture, it's that focus on culture. And how um, I understand that it's, uh, at least for my culture, that it's nothing new, that it's something we've been doing for a long, long, long time. And we've been interacting uh, with the soil and the water for a long, long, long time. So our work revolves around reconnecting people uh, to remind them and let them know um, and hear what it's telling us. I think that our decisions today are so uh, short-sighted and short-term. And when you think of uh, uh, seven generations as an example, that if you can consult within yourself and your culture, that you can look at seven generations behind as what was done that worked and what didn't, and that you understand that whatever you do today has an impact seven generations ahead. That's about 450, 500 years, and we don't plan that far along. You know, we plan two years if 
four years if you're in city council, maybe 12 if you skip from senator to <laughs> assembly to uh, senator house and you come back. So it, it, we don't have those long-term plans. So we, we, we need to do that differently. And that's, that's kind of the stuff that we do. Um, in regards to urban farming, uh, before I, I got involved in water issues, well, I think I've always been involved in water issues. I'm from Colombia, so growing up there, uh, you know, f uh, four days out of the week, uh, the water would be cut off by the municipality, so we lived off the cistern of, of, above ground. So I was doing a lot of these um, conservation things without knowing, uh, in the sense that um, the showers were quick, we didn't have a heater, so you know you didn't want that cold water running down your body, so you take a quick shower, you turn it off, you shampoo, you get back in and you get and you're out. Um, and so uh, farming as well, you know, uh, my dad had a very small lot where he uh, had fruit trees and that was our weekend. We enjoyed um, our time by this river called Las Piedras because it had a lot of rocks. And, and I grew up, but I forgot. And so when I was here, uh, before I got reconnected to things, I, um, I, was, uh, I did social work for about 10 years. And um, then I found myself looking for something different to do. And I'm still doing social work because what we do around farming, what we do around conservation, what we do about uh, lots of things is a behavioral change. And it is looking internally to see how we have an impact around the people and around uh, uh, our community and our cities. Um, so initially a lot of the stuff that I did was uh, social infrastructure around urban farming. Uh, I would be uh, contracting, and I have to say, Urban Semillas is not a nonprofit. Urban Semillas, I intentionally uh, left it as a community-based for-profit because when we were, I felt that you don't have to be a nonprofit to uh, uh, participate in community events and participate in policy changes, and that's what was expected of people to, uh, for large agencies, large corporations, uh, cities, state agencies to come into a community and say, you neighbor who have lived here 10, 20 years, we'd like to get your knowledge, but we won't pay you for it. We want you to come to these meetings. So I said I wanted to change that. I wanted to be part of something different. I wanted to say there is so much value that the community has that you have to pay for that. And if that means that uh, you need um, a liaison to uh, help make that flow, then let's do that. And that's what I wanted to do. So from that, that's, that's how Urban Semia started. It's, it's becoming a community liaison and making sure that the community received uh, a payment for the knowledge that they have. Um, and so I was contracted to come in and do social infrastructure of the Stanford Avalon, which is where uh, a lot of the uh, South Central farmers went to farm. And I organized their elections and um, you know, uh, our stuff is around um, cultivating communities and building capacity so that the people uh, in the communities uh, have the tools to participate, uh, either challenge or support policies that either benefit or uh, impede how to move forward in being self-sufficient. Um, recently, I worked on a, a, a small uh, urban farm uh, half an acre in uh, Glass Hill Park, which was the site about two years ago, two, three years ago, it was the, made the news because it was the house where the main operations of uh, crack dealing were happening in Glass Hill Park. So it was a huge federal agency, local police department. Anyway, so two years later, two and a half years later, the lot is vacant, and through the leadership of uh, Eric Garcetti, uh, they acquired the land. And we were able to um, start to uh, provide a place for, for healing, right? Because I think um, for you to put your hands in the soil, a lot of people that live in that community live in apartments. And so it was very um, rewarding um, to have people that have lived in that community for 30 years renting, living in an apartment, be able to again, have the opportunity to farm, which was their livelihood in their homeland, and all the time they've been in the hustle and bustle and haven't had that opportunity. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure so it's, that was very important. Oh, I'm sure it's very important. It's, it's, it is a very satisfying thing to work the soil, to have a hand in the food that you bring mm -hmm. to your table, that you feed to your children and your families. 
It's, um, that I, I think that's the big perk of, of the work. It's, it's, uh, but it's very important to be connected to that because it connects people to their families, right. their family history, their, their cultural history. And that's something that has been lost in our culture. Uh, there's been a real disconnect. Um, there's been a lot of disconnect. A lot of disconnect yeah. to family and cultural history. And one of the fastest ways to reconnect is through the soil and through skills that are traditional family skills of, of what we now call homesteading, urban homesteading. Um, I want to move on to Eric sure. because I, I, we, we're, I don't want to run out of time, but I'd like to also take some questions from the audience if we have them. So, um, Eric, um, I find I've known Eric for some time and, and um, <laughs> he's very inspiring, also very funny. We've had some really good laughs over the whole concept of urban homesteading. And one time we prepared for an event that we did with Artisanal LA and, in, and uh, his wife Kelly was present there and we were trying to determine how you knew you were on the right path when you're beginning a, a life of sustainability or urban, you know, what makes you a her, an urban homesteader? And I said, um, when your friends start to make fun of you, you know you're on the right mm -hmm. path. And um, in which we all laugh because it's true. The first time you tell somebody you make your own laundry detergent, they think you're insane. You know, I had people years ago laugh at me for, for doing certain things, but now they're asking me, how do you do that? You know, so um, I'm no longer that crazy guy. <laughs> um, I have family asking me. So tell us about your, your newest book, which is really fantastic. I love the title. <laughs> Thank and, you, uh, Craig. That was, a, that was an offer to do a book plug, wasn't it? <laughs> their books are fantastic. Oh, well, if you don't have their books, please go out and get their books. They I just really happen are. to have a copy of the book right here. <laughs> I, can, I can do the Vanna White you yeah. know, <laughs> thing, right? And I, I just happen to be signing this book at noon over the Barnes & Noble booth. So thank you, Craig. You're welcome. Um, it's a real honor to, uh, to be able to make a book plug. No, uh, to uh, be up here with uh, uh, this group of people because uh, Absolutely. this is a group of people that is uh, doing something tangible. Uh, and that's what our books happen to be about. Was that another book plug? I'll stop making the book plugs. Um, the tangible. Um, I'm curious to hear um, where this audience is coming from. Can we have a show of hands here? I want to get a little interaction going. Yeah, so, How many of you are here want us to talk about poultry breeds and how to grow spigarello? Raise show of hands. We got one. Well, Davy, of course, yes, yeah. wants to know. <laughs> Talk to this man about Spigarello afterwards. What's Spigarello, you ask? Uh, how many of you are here because you believe there is a coming zombie apocalypse? OK, there's a fair zombie apocalypse uh, contingent here. How many of you are here because you're hardcore foodies and you want to learn how to make a um, balsamic um, air with dry ice and a wok. Some of the same, curiously, some of the same people who are worried about the zombie apocalypse also want to do molecular gastronomy. That's kind of interesting. That's a, that's a tie-in never, I've never noticed before. How many of you here are, are, um, want to make serious changes in food policy in Los Angeles? Yes, it's a majority. Well, guess what? Um, all of those motivations get to the same purpose, which is exactly what Ricky said earlier, which is that the change comes from within. Change comes from doing something tangible. And the good thing about the um, kinds of things that, that everyone spoke about on this panel, Andy and Ricky and Miguel, is that they are tangible, achievable things. Our, our books that, that my wife and I write are how-to porn. They're, they're about how to make things. There's, there's very little philosophizing in them. 
However, it's really about that inner change because what happens, you see, is you, you, you make a little sauerkraut in your apartment, suddenly you're asking the neighbors if you can use their yard to keep chickens, then you end up composting your own human waste, and then suddenly the revolution starts and you're making changes at the city level and pretty soon we don't need a president anymore because all politics is local, all change comes within, from within, and we are the ones to do that. So um, out of these simple how-to books, all kinds of wonderful things have happened. I've met people like this who are making a huge difference in this city. Uh, and I've also met people who've, who've helped, and I've helped uh, change food policy at the local level. And it's very easy to do, actually. Who, who doesn't like food? Everyone eats, right? So for instance, the city of Los Angeles, believe it or not, it was illegal to grow in a residential zone uh, nuts, flowers, and fruit and resell it. You could grow vegetables and resell it, but you couldn't do those other things because of a ridiculous planning code that basically stipulates the suburban mess that we're in. Uh, that was very easy to change. I called the planning department, I called Eric Garcetti's office, a, a few very uh, a dedicated people in my neighborhood in Silver Lake got that law changed because of course it's ridiculous that you can grow broccoli, which is a flower, but you couldn't grow a flower and resell it. So we, we started the, uh, what became known as the uh, Food and Flowers Freedom Act because everyone likes food, flowers, and freedom, right? Even if you're a teabagger, you like food, flowers, and freedom. Are there any teabaggers here? This is Santa Monica now, <laughs> probably not. All right, curious thing about that is that even though you're all uh, hardcore Maoist Santa Monicans, right? You and the teabaggers can sit down together because guess what? You all agree on the same things in terms of food policy. Um, this is a wonderful movement to be a part of because we can really affect a huge change and we'll start that that local level. We're now moving to the state level. I helped start a group called the uh, Los Angeles Brad Bakers. And one of our members got busted for baking bread and selling it at the Silver Lake Cheese Store. So we're working now on a cottage food act that will make it legal for people to uh, bake and make jams and, and bread and things like that in a home kitchen and resell it. And we're going to work at the state level to make that change. And I have great confidence that we're going to be able to do it. Uh, so with that, I think we should uh, talk about Spigarello and uh, poultry breeds, because that's the, that's the first step in the revolution that begins within. Well, it's interesting, the whole the topic of, of homesteading, you know, what is that? I think there's, there's certainly images of homesteading. We think of canning, we think of growing some of our own food, we think of um, baking our own bread. And certainly all of those things would fall into that category. But I think um, I have to go back to what Ricky said, is that it, the, the point in which that begins is um, a, an internal shift, an internal shift of, um, of thought, Thought to the consequences of your actions, and um, and I have found in my my own sort of journey, um, you know, I, I came from a family of very serious homesteaders. Um, they didn't call it that. They they did what they did because they didn't need otherwise. Um, but then typically, you know, moved away from it in our family and became part of the the. the you know, the, the suburban class and everything came out of the grocery store. Well, now many of my family were kind of rediscovering these, this art that was going to be lost. And I'm very fortunate that I have some elderly family still around that I can learn from. And um, he and I did a wonderful interview with my Uncle Luigi about the uh, wood-fired bread oven that my great-grandmother baked bread in. And someday we'll have to get that online so everybody can hear it. Um, but it's, uh, you'll find that um, you may want to make your own yogurt, so you may buy raw milk from the local farmer's market and go home and make your own yogurt. And you'll find after some time that you'll want to go to the next step and you'll want to have the goat <laughs> to make the milk that makes your yogurt. Mm -hmm. 
and, um, and follow that path and you'll find it's a very satisfying life to have so much input into your daily living and there's a great sense of freedom and a great sense of power and just simple enjoyment and it certainly is a more healthful source of food and living than, um, than typical store-bought. Um, quickly want to go on, I, I want to move on to see if there's any questions. We don't have a lot of time. And let's see, Susan or, no, Desiree, is that you out there? There's somebody here with a microphone, Desiree. Otherwise, we apparently won't hear you. Hello, my name is Irene Peña. Uh, Eric. Uh, my name is Irene Peña, and I come from um, Boyle Heights, East LA, um, with an organization called Proyecto Jardín. And I'm very curious to know a little bit more about the policy uh, pursuits that you mentioned with respect to cottage food, and maybe if you could elaborate how far you've gone down that path and why you decided to pursue state level as opposed to a local um, county policy approach. Yeah, as actually as Craig alluded to here, we've had a lapse of common sense for the past 50 years, whereas you know all of our immigrant relatives, mine included, uh, had chickens in their backyard in Los Angeles and did things like that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, during that period of snowballs and Cheetos and uh, TV dinners, uh, a lot of common sense practices were outlawed. So for instance, it is actually illegal to have a church or synagogue bake sale right now in the county of Los Angeles, and in fact, a synagogue was busted for proposing a bake sale. Um, the Cottage Food Act needs to be pursued at the state level because there are state laws forbidding, uh, it's, it's actually rather complicated, but forbidding making food in a non-inspected kitchen and then reselling it. These root laws are routinely broken. Uh, I see a lot of things being sold at farmers markets that I think are probably technically illegal. Um, so at this point, uh, there is an organization in Northern California with a team of lawyers who've come up with draft legislation. Uh, and uh, we, are, um, we have a state senator who uh, looks like he's going to sponsor it. And then it will be a legislative process of getting it through a subcommittee uh, and then getting it approved. But like the Food and Flowers Freedom Act, I have great confidence that it will pass because there are a lot of cottage food laws in other states, red states actually, that have in fact very liberal laws. The one we're proposing, it will be a pretty simple one. You have to take, I think it's called Serve Something. It's an inexpensive food safety class that you do when you're a restaurant worker. Safe serve. A safe serve, thank you. Uh, and then um, a few simple common sense rules, and you'll be able to, to make what, what are called non-hazardous foods, so, so things like uh, muffins, jams, bread. Uh, bread, that kind of thing. Uh, so, and if you have any more questions about it, you can talk to me afterwards or join the Los Angeles Brad Bakers on Meetup. Uh, we have a little subsection of our Meetup group that's dealing with the cottage food bill. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I want to say, where have you been my whole life? <laughs> uh, after the first year of, of, of going in and selling uh, what became my sweet line, which is the sweet spot, which is a, a pecan tart, um, I, I, uh, I was shut down by the health department, who was certain that I was baking it out of my alley, garage, <laughs> yeah. when in fact uh, I had been given space by John Gerkeshe from a family that owns Pioneer Bakery, which is a 105-year-old bakery. So John learned what I was doing. He reminded of his ancestor, his father that started it. So he allowed me to use his overnight kitchen space uh, over in Santa Monica on Montana Street. But this one health inspector was just so certain that I was uh, uh, breaking it because our booth was different. Instead of having signs, I used chalkboards because I didn't want to waste paper. Instead of uh, having the plastic sample cups that you put lids on that weren't recyclable, I was using open, um, I was using paper. 
So this was a red flag for him, and they shut me down for four, three or four months, whatever a quarter is, and I lost $30,000 worth of revenue. But as I said, I, I really don't look at humans as my teacher. I try to look at the earth, and water is my teacher. And what I always do is flow. So when that happened, that's when I start looking at getting distribution. So never let bureaucracy stop you. you. Do use water as your teacher. It's a great teacher. It's been a great one of mine. And always flow. And it's indifferent. It's always going to the source. But my, my question to you was that I could have so used that. And it happens all the time. And they really don't, um, they just have rules that they follow that go against what we're trying to achieve. And uh, so there's I just, a lot of contra there's a lot of contradiction, contradiction? between ag you know ag rules and how they're applied, health department rules and how they're applied, and those two departments don't always necessarily uh, interact or communicate with each other. So there can be very frustrating uh, contradictions. But you just don't give up. No. You Resilience. find a new course. Resilience, regeneration. You just keep moving forward. Was there any other questions in the audience? Oh, okay. She's at the top. Go ahead. The one that where they were all they were arrested and. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you know? Well, I'll, can I speak to that? I'll tell you what I I don't know. Can you repeat the question? Uh, over on Rose, there's a. Um, Rose, right next to Groundwork, there's a, a raw food. Uh, I forget exactly what it's raw called. Milk. It's called Rossum. Rossum, and they, yeah. and they sell raw milk, raw which milk. is yeah. legal in the it state. Really, yeah. It is legal yeah. in the state, but apparently yeah. the raw milk they were selling was from out of state, which is illegal. And they do not have a permit to sell raw milk. And apparently they didn't even have a permit to have a business there. Hmm. Now, I know uh, my understanding is, and I could be wrong, my understanding is they felt they didn't need a permit because they were a private club. But then my, my, I have also read that they, and I ha don't have confirmation of this, but this was one of the accusations, that they sold raw milk to people who walked in off the street who were not members. I don't have confirmation of that, but that's what I have read and what I've been told. And um, what has happened there is not so much about the raw milk itself, but about breaking laws and rules of interstate traffic of raw milk and lack of permits. That's about all I'd like to say because it's a huge, huge, deep hole of all kinds of accusations, mm -hmm. but apparently they spent more than a year investigating mm -hmm. before, they, before they went to that action. I'm sorry? Oh, they were raided once before, and, and, and then, a, then an investigation went on for about a year and a half, and then, it, and then, then this, this raid occurred where um, uh, Sharon Palmer from Healthy Family Farms was thrown in jail because she was, she was involved. But the accusations against her at this point I don't think have anything to do with the raw milk so much as the source of some of her products. But I, I don't know. I don't know much more than that. There's just a lot out there. There's a lot out there. By the way, you know, I really moved quickly because I wanted to make sure, because you know, Andy had to take off, so I didn't introduce myself. I'm Craig from Winneka Farms, and Winneka Farms is a suburban farm in the West San Fernando Valley. We specialize in Italian heirloom vegetables, and also we have a breed of heritage chickens from Holland called the Barnevelder, which is a, to me, pretty special thing, and, um, and um, employ homesteading practices. We do crazy things like make our own laundry detergent and do a lot of canning. I'm part of the, the, the newest class of the UC Extension Master Food Preserver course. So I'll have that designation coming up shortly. Well, I don't know, maybe six, I don't know, sometime in November I think that finishes. But that's an exciting thing. And you will find a Facebook page for the Master Food Preservers uh, on Facebook. It's the only Master Pre Preserver organization in the entire country that actually has a Facebook presence. And it's, uh, it's manned by some really knowledgeable people. So you can go there and submit your questions and ask for assistance if you're interested in canning. Um, can I just say something, Craig? I met Craig because this man sells the finest seeds in the world. <laughs> and I mean that. Uh, stunning, amazing yeah. vegetables. He is a tremendous resource to, to this city. If you have any questions about growing food, you've got to talk to this guy. Uh, I grow a great deal of food. And I, I, uh, because of family uh, heritage, um, I specialize in all Italian. And I have, my seeds are brought from Italy. 
and I do have them available, but he mentioned Spigarello, and you're all probably wondering, what the heck is Spigarello? Spigarello is a dialect name for something. Its full name is Cavallo Broccolo Ghetto di Napoli, which basically means branching broccoli of Naples, and it's an heirloom broccoli, but mainly it's the leaves that are eaten, and um, if you're a fan of kale, um, you, you would absolutely love the spigarello. It's, uh, in my opinion, I've given up kale for spigarello. It's fantastic. Sometimes you'll find it at the Santa Monica Farmer's Market. Bill Coleman grows a variety of it, has for many years. Um, and it's, uh, but that's what spigarello is. Am I allowed to swear? <laughs> because my <laughs> wife and I grew spigarello last year, and I tasted the first bite of it, and I looked at Kelly and I said, this is the best fucking vegetable I've ever eaten. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that. I apologize officially for that. <laughs> it really is an incredible vegetable. But, uh, but yeah, um, uh, I, th I think we're probably going to get kicked out of here. Yeah. Now, I, I hadn't asked any of these guys, but um, I'm going to... I'd like to go out to the front because we need to clear this room any moment here because they're going to tell us to get out. But I'd like to be out there for a while. So if anybody would like to speak to me or if any of these three men have a few moments to maybe say hello. I mean, if you have to run off, you have to run off. But I'm going to be outside for a while. So if anybody would like to. I'm going to run. I just I forgot to mention one thing. Oh, please. Uh, 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 there is a website that has it's a little sick right now, but it, we're going to relaunch it in the fall. And it's called Grow Friend. And it, what it does is connects people that have property uh, for farming and uh, urban farmers uh, to link up yeah. and uh, make that exchange. Oh, that's uh, a great. Without that's fear or anything. So it'll, we're, we're, we're fixing it. Uh, we're, we're tweaking it a little bit. So we'll probably relaunch it in about a month and a half. So it's girlfriend.com. And it, it's that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, that's and, fantastic. And if I may say, uh, what we're doing, please go to urbangreenla.com. Uh, we do have a website that we're uh, constantly developing. Uh, we do need the community support and volunteers. Uh, I'm uh, implementing a new program called Return of Eden, Re Return to Eden, because I believe that our, our cities are a prime space to grow food. Particularly in Los Angeles, uh, if there's ever an earthquake, the trucks aren't rolling in from the Central Valley. Uh, the port in, in Long Beach is going to be closed. Um, but we do not need to re revert to fear. We can do this on our own here in, in our city. So uh, I am asking for your help. Absolutely. We have fantastic weather for it. Thank you. Yes. Good. I think it's, that's Good. it. Right. Thank you.